Well, hey, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad you guys are here. Uh, if you've been around Resonate at all, for the last six months, we've been walking through the book of Luke, looking at the life of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, and allowing Jesus to inform our lives and direct our path so that we, uh, we, we want to look like him. We want to we wanna be conformed into his likeness. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, and, and the difficulty with the book of Luke <clears throat> is if you go through it chronologically, there are places where you come to in the, in the in the Bible, the Bible's interesting. It's, it's interesting for a lot of reasons, but, but there's places where if you're preaching straight through it, there's things that are, that are really hard to talk about. Uh, and so sometimes on occasion, uh, we'll, we'll like post on social media what we're going to be preaching about. Like, oh, excited for church. See you there. Going to be awesome. Uh, we would not have posted that this week. Uh, because what we're about to talk about, if, if we were to have told you beforehand, you, you probably wouldn't have come. And you certainly wouldn't have invited your friend. So if you did uh, invite your friend tonight, uh, this is about to get interesting, okay? Uh, Because we should have seen this last week when we looked at the Lord's Prayer, but things are about to get much more serious in the book of Luke. And and you hear it in the Lord's Prayer. Last week we looked at the Lord's Prayer, and, and Jesus prays, God, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. And so you sort of hear about this arrival of a kingdom, And it's good news. There's a new kingdom arriving. But when you hear about the arrival of a kingdom, it sort of insinuates that there's currently a kingdom operating as the powerful leader of the world that this other kingdom is coming to to conflict with. And then if you go further down in the Lord's Prayer, you hear this part where Jesus says, deliver us from temptation uh, and save us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. So now you're like, wow, on one hand, that's just a prayer. On the other hand, you're like, there's a real evil one. And, and Jesus is praying that we would be delivered from him. And so this, this, kind, of, this kind of stuff gets much more uh, conflict-oriented right after the Lord's Prayer. So if you have a Bible, grab it and turn to Luke chapter 11. And we're just going to pick up right where we left off. Like Jesus is teaching on prayer. And then this thing turns where he, he gets into an interaction and a confrontation with some guys uh, and stuff just gets real. I don't know if you've had those moments where you're like, man, this just got real. Like in junior high, you're joking, and then someone says, your mom, and you're like, whoa, man, this just got real. Or like on This Is Us a couple weeks ago, when they're in the counseling session, you know, and he says the thing to mom, and mom says the thing back, and you're like, whoa, this just got real. It's about to get real. If you watch This Is Us, you're like, the Bible makes sense to me now. <laughs> Here we go, Luke chapter 11, starting in verse... 14. Um, Now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. So Jesus cast out a demon that was not allowing this guy to speak. And then the guy can speak and everyone's amazed. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others to test him, they kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? So Jesus goes, there's, there's Satan, and he has a kingdom, and he doesn't want to divide that kingdom because he's trying to accomplish something with his kingdom as well. How does that kingdom stand? So he goes on to say, For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Verse 20. But if by the finger of God I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then Jesus turns to tell a story. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So all of a sudden, there's a confrontation in the story, and Jesus makes it very clear what he's about. So he, in the story, casts out a demon. I don't know what you think about Jesus, if he's sweet, if he has the blonde hair and the blue eyes, but this is like a different Jesus who just got real with these guys, because he cast out a demon that was not allowing someone to speak. And if you know anything about miracles, the point of a miracle isn't just so a guy gets healed. The point of the miracle is that it would point to something. It's called a sign. What do signs do? Signs point to something. Jesus is representing his kingdom, manifesting itself in the healing of this guy. 
So in Jesus' kingdom, there is no sickness. There is no blindness. There is no muteness. There is no uh, you know, lameness. And so he calls out of that guy uh, an opportunity to experience the kingdom of God right here on this earth. And it's profound and it's powerful and everybody marvels. So Jesus shows his power. And in the moment of showing what his kingdom looks like, these accusers come against him and they say, you cast out demons by the power of Beelzebul. Now Beelzebul is essentially the, another name for Satan, and you see that in the scripture, but it can be translated to the prince of demons, and it's a name derived from the Philistine god Baal. So what these guys just did is they said, oh, we saw your power, but your power actually comes from the devil. So good job healing, Jesus, but we know where your power really comes from, and something inside of Jesus gets so lit up that he goes, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. Don't you dare confuse that, because that's the thing that's like the most important thing in the world. That's actually the reason why I came here. So be careful confusing that thing. And so Jesus tells him a story. He's like, a house can't stand if it gets divided. And then he lands this story right here. He says, the guy you're talking about, Satan, he, he says, it's, it's like there's a strong man. And this strong man is guarding his palace, and he has armor on, and he's protecting his possessions. And as long as that strong man is intact and is in his position, his possessions are safe. And everyone's nodding along like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Jesus says, until a stronger man comes. And then when the stronger man comes, he goes to that strong man and he removes him from his position of power. He disarms him of his armor and he takes away the things that he previously possessed. So Jesus is making something very clear to everybody listening. This is so serious to Jesus. And here's why it's so serious. Because Jesus is saying, this world is under the guard of a strong man. And that strong man's name is the devil. This world is under the guard of a strong man. There are two kingdoms here. One is the kingdom of God. One is the kingdom of the devil. One is the kingdom of heaven. One is the kingdom of Hell And Jesus is serious about the accusation that he's a part of the other kingdom because the very thing he came to do was to be an affront to the other kingdom. So they go, oh, you, you're actually part of Beelzebub and that whole crew. And Jesus is like, no, um, thanks for asking. I stand here in direct defiance of that other kingdom. I'm glad you brought that up. And the reason Jesus is so serious about this is because he knows there are two kingdoms. And listen, this is key. Both of these kingdoms that are present right here on earth, they are both everlasting kingdoms. They are eternal kingdoms. And the reason why this is so serious to Jesus is because Jesus knows the decision of what kingdom you eternally dwell in is a decision that is made here on this earth. Eternal kingdoms are affected by the temporal world that you and I live in. Life is short, eternity is long, and what we do with our lives directly affect eternity. Now, I think when we talk about eternity, most people would generally go, yeah, I get that. I, I, I can kind of go there with you, Josh. There's probably an eternity out there. Uh, so I did some research, and what's great about research is you can find stats to back up anything you believe. It's amazing. I did it. Just go on Google, look for stuff, find your facts. So here, here we go. I found some. Allegedly, according to Google.com, there are over 80% of Americans believe there is some kind of afterlife. I don't think that's controversial. I think all of you go, okay, I buy that. A little more interestingly, 68% of Americans not only just believe there's an afterlife, they believe that there is a hell that is a place of eternal punishment. 68% of people. Now, more interestingly, is only 2% of the people surveyed believe that they are going to hell in the afterlife. <laughs> only 2%. 80% say, yeah, it's probably out there. 68 say, there's probably a place where people are punished. Only 2% of the people believe that they are going there. All of us like good news. All of us like eternity where we are in the, the good place where we go fishing and we uh, play with our dog. If you're into country music, you know, it's always like fishing and dog and my, my cousin Hank's there and we're like drinking cold ones and that's heaven. I'll, 80% I'm going there, right? <laughs> country music in one sentence, one synopsis right there. That is what people think. There, there was a book that was written in 2010 called Heaven is for Real. 
Number one best-selling book sold 8 million copies. So popular that in 2014, they made it into a movie. Heaven is for real. It tells a story of a three-year-old boy who goes in to have surgery, and he comes out of surgery with these confessions about people he shouldn't know and things he shouldn't understand, and he tells his parents, I went to heaven. They write a book about it. Heaven is for real. Everybody loves that book. Uplifting, popular, makes you feel good, light reading on an airplane. Now, could you imagine just for a moment, there is a book on the bookshelf next to Heaven is for Real called Hell is for Real. Just go with me for a second. You're you're at the Christmas gift exchange and you draw your brother-in-law's name and you're like, I wonder what my brother-in-law would like for Christmas. It's a book exchange, so you go on Amazon. You're like looking at books and you see Hell is for Real. Are you buying that for your brother-in-law? Maybe, right? <laughs> Maybe, depending on your brother-in-law. Are you about to get on a plane and you see Hudson Bookstore right there uh, in the Seattle airport and you're like, okay, I need a book. This is a long flight. I need something to read. And right there on the shelf is Hell is for Real, a true story of someone who goes to hell and comes back. Are you going to buy that book? Probably not. But can we be intellectually honest here? You can't just believe heaven is for real and not believe hell is for real. And praise God, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus, when they accuse him of being uh, of the kingdom of hell, Jesus doesn't go, what? What are you guys talking about? There's no such thing as hell. I am from the kingdom of heaven. Beelzebul, no such thing. Satan, no such thing. Hell, no such thing. Glad you guys brought that up. There's no such thing. No, he doesn't do that. He says, there is a such a thing. And I need everybody to know that's the exact opposite of what I'm here to accomplish. It's a very, very different things. And so it kind of leads us to the question of if this is true, if there is a kingdom of heaven, which we talk about pretty often, and there is a kingdom of hell, and Jesus is so serious about making it known that he is not a part of the kingdom of hell, it, it kind of begs the question, what, what does Jesus have to say about this kingdom of hell? Does Jesus teach anything about hell? And why is he so serious when it gets confused that what he's here to accomplish and people think it's of that kingdom. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at five things Jesus teaches about hell. And listen, we do not, as your pastors, we do not go into this lightly. This is not fun for us. This is not, like when you start studying hell, you do not get excited. You feel burden. You feel responsibility. You feel a sense of brokenness for the people uh, in my life who, who don't yet believe in Christ, keyword yet believe in Christ, like there's some stuff that it's serious. And so as we look at this, all I'm going to do is read to you the words of Jesus. So that at the end of this, you can't look at me and say, oh, I disagree with the guy that, that spoke. I disagree with the preacher. I'm going to offer you words in red in your Bible about what Jesus has to say about hell. And then we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean for me? If he was so serious about not being confused, what does it mean for me and how do I respond? So the first thing Jesus teaches us about hell is that hell is worse than the worst physical persecution you could face. Hell is worse than the worst physical persecution you could face. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, and Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, you know from church history, many disciples were uh, killed for their faith in Christ. And Jesus is clear. He's like, there's going to come a time when people persecute you. Do not be afraid of those who can only kill your body. Be afraid of those who can kill your soul in hell. And so men and women throughout history have been tortured to death, burned alive, crucified for the sake of Christ. And they went to their deaths unafraid. Why? Because they weren't afraid of those who killed the body. They had put their allegiance in another place. So Jesus says, hell is worse than any physical persecution you could face. Number two, Jesus teaches us hell is human misery forever. Human misery forever. I remember in high school when I got serious about my faith, I would try to talk to some of my friends who weren't interested in church and weren't interested in Jesus, I would try to invite them to things, and they saw me in my whole life at that time as uh, nerdy and not cool and not fun and not popular and all these other really immature, dumb things. They saw that, and they started to think to themselves, um, I would rather have my party life 
and my fun and my sin right now. And, and honestly, I would rather have this party forever than I would desire to be a part of you and your boring church crew. And so they thought to themselves that, that they will just party for eternity while I'll go and do boring stuff for eternity. And one of the major misconceptions about hell is that people falsely believe hell is just an eternal opportunity to enjoy the sinful pleasures you've known here on earth. People believe that hell is just an eternal opportunity to enjoy the sinful pleasures you had on earth. Hell is not sinful pleasure forever. Hell is human misery forever. How how do we know that? Well, if we're honest with one another, and I know it's hard sometimes, but if you're honest, sin, sin is fun. Sin is really fun. Right? Tweet that. Sin is fun. (laughs) Comma. For a little while. And then something happens. Every time. Sin starts to break down. You start to feel brokenness. You start to feel shame and guilt and sorrow. And relationships fall apart. And turns out that thing didn't actually have the lasting impact you thought it was going to have. And next thing you know, you find yourself in a place that you never wanted to be. Because when sin takes you to its end, it's always shame. It's always isolation. And the Bible says it always ends in death. And so hell is the place where sin has been taken to its end and now is reigning in that state for eternity. And that's not human pleasure forever. That's human misery forever. This is a really hard parable Jesus teaches in Matthew 13, the parable of the weeds. And he says this, Then he left the crowds and he went into the house and his disciples came with him and said, Explain to us the parables of the weeds in the field. And he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world." And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. And the weeds are the people of this evil are the people of the evil one. And the enemy, he who sows them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. When Jesus talked about hell, he called it Gehenna. Gehenna was a place right outside the city of Jerusalem where in the Old Testament, worshipers of the god Molech would offer their children to be sacrificed to this god. It was a condemned place. And later, the people of Israel started burning their trash in that place. And and the trash smelled so bad, they put sulfur perpetually burning to kind of drown out the smell. And it was just this perpetual fire in this perpetually miserable place. And Jesus would point to that place illustratively uh, and say, that's what hell is like. It's like Gehenna. It's like that place. He's trying to give us a picture of what it looked like there. The third thing Jesus teaches us is that hell is eternal punishment. This isn't a short reckoning that you go through where you pay for the sins that you committed in this world and then somehow make it end later. This this is an etern there's an eternality to what we're talking about. There's not a temporal component to hell. There's an eternal picture that Jesus paints. In Matthew 25, it says this: When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels are with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance. What's the inheritance of believers? The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed to clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me and I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous, these aren't just moral people, they're righteous. Their hearts have been made new by Christ. The righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king replied, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needed clothing or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Again, the choices that we make, Jesus fully understands they have eternal consequence, and he loves us enough to tell us that. The fourth thing Jesus teaches about hell is that hell is perpetual fire. Now, now some scholars debate whether this is literal or this is just imagery. Either way, this, the, the reality is this is not a consuming fire, but rather it is an ongoing pain that is being portrayed as fire. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus It says in verse 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and they were to be thrown into the sea. For if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, for it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus is serious about this. I think the urgency from Jesus when he gets accused of being a part of the other kingdom, something inside of him really flares up because he goes, you guys don't understand. Me and that other kingdom, we have nothing in common. I am here to completely demolish and destroy that other kingdom. There is no reason for the people of the kingdom of God to have anything to do with the kingdom of hell. And so he's, he's coming and saying, these, these two kingdoms, they are not at peace with one another. They're not at peace. Is Jesus saying, cut off your hand and cut off your foot and gouge out your eyes? No, no, no. He's saying, be serious about sin in your life. Do not make accommodations for sin because sin is of the kingdom of hell and you have been brought out of that kingdom. And so if something is drawing you back into that kingdom, temptations or the evil one is drawing you back, Jesus says, you need to look at the sin in your life, not as your friend, but as your enemy. You need a combative stance against your sin, not an accommodation posture towards your sin that says, sure, it's no big deal. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I sin. No big deal. No, Jesus says, it's a big deal. And eternity's on the line. Make no accommodation for sin. Make war with sin. And the last thing Jesus teaches about hell is that hell is the conscious awareness of something better that is unattainable. Hell is the conscious awareness of something that is far better, but that you can never attain. In Luke chapter 16, just a few chapters later, From where we currently are in Luke, Jesus says this. He says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dog came and licked his sores. But the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. That's heaven terminology, Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, hell terminology, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away. So apparently he, there's, you can see far away by Lazarus' side. And he called to him and said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger into water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in the fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Verse 26 is huge to this whole thing. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Hell is a place where people are aware that there is a God that they rejected having a relationship with. Hell is an understanding, perpetually aware of what you rejected. It is recognizing 
on a day-to-day basis that you no longer have what is most beautiful. And you no longer experience the grace of God in your life. Now, even though all I just did was read to you the words of Jesus, many of us in this room are going, whoa, man, that is way too hard. That is way too scary. I really wish you would have posted on social media because I wouldn't have brought my friend tonight. This is too much, man. Like, we're in, like, 2018, you know, because, like, what year it is is, like, a great argument these days. We're in, like, 2018, man. That's old stuff. The brilliance of the Bible's relevance is that it doesn't try to be relevant. It just is true which is the most relevant thing in the world. And so you go, this is crazy. I can't believe it. All I just did was read to you Jesus. But if I read other things in Jesus, you're like, oh yeah, that's great, but this is the hard stuff, right? And if we're honest, every single human mind has a bend towards universalism. Every single human mind starts to find themselves leaning towards universalism, which basically says, It doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you're faithful to that, then surely you get to go to heaven in the end. Uh, You know, even though people don't believe in Christ and even though they've been bad, like as long as they've done just enough good to outweigh their bad, it's okay. You know, and you're always like going to compare yourself to Hitler. And it's like, yeah, I'm better than him. But it's like nobody wants to compare themselves to Mother Teresa because they're like, whoa, man, nobody's perfect. And you're like, maybe someone is perfect. (laughs) Maybe that's what we most need in the world. As someone who's perfect to step into the story. But most of us still, we lean that way and we think in our minds, like, I know the Bible says that and I believe the Bible. I love the Bible. But that part, man, that's crazy. So in our minds, we go at the end of the day, somehow love's going to win or grace is going to win or God's kindness is going to win. There's a back door somehow. And all of us start to believe that to be true. And we can't help it. That's where we find ourselves. And the sad thing is that you can go and find a lot of preachers and teachers to feed that false truth to you. You can find a lot of people that would say, oh, this is not true. This is no big deal. But what if we took the words of Jesus and believed him? And what if what he was teaching, he was so serious about being confused for the other kingdom. What if he was so serious about that? Because he knew in his mind there was a there was an end game. There was a place where he was going that was going to absolutely destroy this other kingdom. But in order for us to believe that, you have to see Jesus for who he really is. You can't just relegate him to Jesus was a social reformer, uh, but man, then he had a bad run-in with the Romans and he died too young. Oh, bad Jesus, like really good stuff. And then poor Jesus, those Romans got him. Or you go the other way, which is kind of the Christian route, which is like, um, yeah, I don't want to go to hell, right? I don't want to go there. So I believe Jesus And I'm going to go to heaven later. And Jesus is king of heaven later. But you know who's king of heaven now? Me. I get to run my life. I get to do whatever I want. But in the end, oh yeah, I have fire insurance. I can go to heaven later. Both of those are broken. None of those are the gospel. The gospel is that absolutely Jesus was a social reformer that had justice and lived a beautiful picture of what humanity could be. But also, he is not king later. He is king now. This is the story of the gospel. I have good news, Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is available. The kingdom of hell is what has you in its grip. There is a strong man who has all of the world in its grip. And Jesus comes into the world and says, I have good news. A stronger man is here. And there's another kingdom available. The kingdom of hell is going to lose its grip on you. And the way it loses its grip on you is staggering. It loses its grip on you because of what Jesus does with his life. He takes his life. He takes himself all the way to the cross in our place. So why is this so significant? Jesus believes in the reality of hell because he took on himself the worst of it. So just, just show of hands, just for fun, how many of you in this room have ever heard Jesus called a Savior? You ever heard called, Jesus called a Savior? You've heard that before? Okay, so you've heard that before. I've heard that before. Here's my question to us. What is Jesus saving you from if he's a Savior? Honestly, what are you being saved from? Now, now a lot of us would say, oh, I'm being saved from my sin, 
or myself or, you know, a life that was less than God's best. I'm being saved from all that. But listen, I, I submit to you, Jesus could have saved you from all that stuff lots of different ways. There's one primary thing he was saving you from that we don't talk about very often. And here's the truth. The main thing Jesus saved us from was the coming wrath of God. The main thing he did was he saw the tidal wave of God's wrath coming for a broken, sinful world, totally in the grip of the strong man named the devil. And the tidal of God's wrath, which, by the way, is absolutely just and absolutely deserved, the tidal wave of God's wrath was coming for all of creation, and Jesus stood in front of it, and he absorbed into himself all of the punishment for sin, all of the penalty for sin, all of the shame of sin, all the guilt of sin, sin, all the things that sin brings, he absorbed it into himself on the cross so that when the tidal wave of God's wrath comes for you and comes for me, the Bible says we are now, if you believe in Christ, we are now hidden in Christ. That the tidal wave of God's wrath will see the blood of Christ. This is Passover language. This is Old Testament Exodus terminology. It will see the blood of Christ and it will pass over us. So the reason Jesus is so serious is he believes in hell because he took it on himself and faced it firsthand. Jesus believes in hell because he bore the penalty of hell in our place. Jesus understands and teaches about hell because he defeated hell in the resurrection. And Jesus teaches about hell because he knows it has been overcome so that heaven could be offered to us in the gospel. You don't need a three-year-old teaching you about heaven when you have the resurrection teaching you about heaven. There is something called hell, but I have good news. It is not the only kingdom. And there's another kingdom and it's available. And it has been made available to you in Christ because the moment God poured out all of hell on Jesus, God was simultaneously pouring out all of heaven on us. It's called the great exchange. That Jesus took what we deserved, hell, And then offered to us what he deserved, heaven. And he did that because he loves us and he is for us. But we have to recognize that the cross teaches us there is something to be saved from. It's the coming wrath of God. It's the grip of the kingdom of hell on our lives. You have to see this, that God's wrath was coming. And Jesus stood in front of it. In Romans chapter 5, this is so beautiful. In verse 6, it says, you see... At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from what? God's wrath through him. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Jesus believed that there was a day coming where the wrath of God was going to come for people who stood under that wrath, so he stood in our place. Now again, universalism goes, oh, okay, listen, uh, I I get that. That's called the gospel. That's good news. Yeah, way to go, Jesus. Um, But here's the deal. Um, I still don't know if everybody has to go through Jesus to get to heaven. And so what we do is we become God's judge. And we start to think to ourselves, uh, you know what? Murderers, they go to hell. Um, Sexual predators, they go to hell. Like pedophiles, oh my gosh, of course. They go like, all these people go to hell. But like, what what about the guys that, um, what about that old lady in my neighborhood who's like really nice? And yeah, she's not religious. She doesn't believe in God. But like, what about her? Like, she's really nice. Doesn't she get like a backdoor in? Doesn't she get in some other way? But what Jesus teaches us with his perfect life and then leading himself to the cross, what he teaches us is that if there was any other way to heaven other than the cross, he would have done that. But there was no other way to get to heaven other than the cross. So if that lady who lives in your neighborhood who is really nice 
but doesn't believe in Jesus, if she can get to heaven some other way, then the truth is Jesus was a fool. Jesus, why would you go to the cross if there was some other way? You should be pitied, Jesus. Man, thanks for doing that. That was a little extreme. You didn't actually have to do that. It turns out there was another way. Why in the world did you do that? The only reason Jesus did it is because he knew that the only way into the kingdom of God was through his life in our place. That's why it was done. The greatest thing Jesus teaches about hell is not just the five things we looked at a second ago. The greatest news that Jesus teaches about hell is that hell is avoidable. It's avoidable. The guy on the cross next to Jesus avoided hell. The only guy in human history to both get what he deserves and what he doesn't is the thief on the cross next to Jesus. And he looks at Jesus and says, I see you for who you are. Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? I see that you're a king. And Jesus looks back and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Hell is avoidable. The strong man has his grip on the world. And he has possessed all of us. And Jesus says, a stronger man has come into the world. There's an author named N.T. Wright. And he basically says, Jesus came into the world to say one thing. The stronger man has arrived. The grip of hell is no longer the grip that has to have the last word over your life. It is avoidable. But you have to come to grips to the fact that it's only avoidable through the cross. It's not avoidable, uh, available through good news. It's not avoidable through being a good person. It's not avoidable through trying your best. It's not avoidable through any other thing except for the cross. But our human minds, man, we start to make up things and we start to ask questions like this. Okay, Josh, heard your sermon. Okay, cool. But listen, let me ask you this. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? But I, I submit to you, that's the human mind with a human twist. Because I could ask you back, how could anyone reject a loving God? How could a loving God send anyone to hell? How in the world are there people in this life that are rejecting a loving God? One of my favorite authors and theologians, R.C. Sproul, passed away recently, and I heard him doing a Q&A, and he got this question. He was asked by someone in the crowd, R.C. Sproul, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? And R.C.'s like old, he like had oxygen in his nose, he was about to uh, pass away, and, and he looks back at the crowd and he says, sir, that is the wrong question. The question is not, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? The question is, how can a loving God not send everyone to hell? And the reason God doesn't send everyone to hell is because he's loving. But somehow you took that question and made the loving God the bad guy. It's like we read our Bibles like John 3.16 says, God so hated the world that he killed his own son. No, 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 no. It's God so loved the world that he saw the world in the grip of a strong man. And so he sent forth his son as a stronger man who was willing to pay the penalty for all of us. So that the good news is you don't have to stay under the grip of this kingdom, heading eternally into that kingdom. You can be transferred. The terminology of adoption is, uh, of, of the gospel is adoption, being transferred, being given a new family, coming out of this, this other kingdom into the kingdom that God offers you. And that's the good news of the gospel. That hell is avoidable. And the key to this passage for us as the church is to recognize that last little part where Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. And if you don't gather, then you scatter. And so what has to happen for us as a church is we have to believe this to be true. And this should inform our urgency in, in two things. One, gospel work in the world, the good work of, of the world, but also the good news that we need to proclaim. And we need to recognize that God has sent us into this world, not just to go to heaven when we die, but to bring the kingdom of God right here to this world and to gather more people into his kingdom. Charles Spurgeon was a pastor in London and he would, tell, he would tell his church, he said, church, our job is to make it hard to go to hell from London. Because we have so many people living for the kingdom, sharing the good news. I submit to you, resonate. It should be hard to go to hell from a college campus in the Northwest. Because people 
have seen the eternal implications of life and have felt the urgency of Jesus and said to themselves, I am going to bring the kingdom of God to wherever I find myself. I am going to gather people into the kingdom. It should be hard to go to hell from our cities. It should be hard to go to hell from our campuses because that's the work of the church. And Charles Spurgeon says, if someone is really committed to going to hell, then make them jump over our dead bodies to get there. That the church is to stand in the gap and to be bringers of good news and communicators of good news to tell the world, hey, you may not know this right now, but believe it or not, you are under the grip of something. Whether we talk about it or not, there, there, is, there is forces that are, that are gripping us and we are to be people walking the world looking like freedom, <coughs> looking like people who are a part of something different and they should see that, the world should see that and they should want it. And that's what Jesus is doing in this passage. He is saying, if you're one of my people, then you are a bringer of the kingdom and you are a gatherer of my people. So my prayer for us is that this reality of a kingdom of heaven and a kingdom of hell would stir up in us an urgency to share the good news about the other kingdom and to share the good news about the one who is stronger and the one who can overcome whatever you're going through because that's the good news the world needs and that's why Jesus showed up and said, it's available, it's come, the good news is here. Come to me and receive the good news. If we want to be like him, then that is our mission as well, to bring the kingdom of God and to gather people.